Oh, yeah. Someone's awake. <laughs> I think the morning after the night before. Uh, this is me, <laughs> and uh, if you wish to make contact with me, then of course I can give you a card afterwards, but uh, I think it's difficult to read, maybe towards the back. This is uh, my email, and what I'm involved with um, is an organization called ITA Professional, which is a part of the ITA. Um, and with ITA Professional, I am running programs, postgraduate programs, uh, master programs, and doctoral work in, in this area, in um, consciousness studies, spirituality, and transpersonal psychology. Uh, and if anyone's interested, then obviously be in touch. <clears throat> so I chose a provocative title. I don't always do such things, but I thought it appropriate. A compromise too far. What's the compromise? Well, to put it in an extreme way, and then I'll say something less extreme in a moment. To put it in an extreme way, practices which have their roots and their context in mystical and religious traditions are increasingly being employed, especially within Western contexts, and not only Western contexts. And in the process, I would say they are to some extent being corrupted. And the compromise is that we, in the name of transpersonal psychology, are acquiescent. We think it's okay. So my point of view is to say, well, maybe it's not okay. That's the extreme way of putting it. Um, and again, to be extreme, provocative. It reminds me, appropriate part of the world, of the Trojan horse. So there's, in the UK especially, there is an aggressive new atheism. I'm sure most may have heard of Richard Dawkins, for example. There are others as well. And that's not the subject, I could talk for an hour just on that subject and the, and, the, and the straw men that are being set up, but let's leave that for the moment. Um, but the, 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 the work in the area of mindfulness, there are some aspects a bit like the Trojan horse. So those who would want to see uh, all areas of endeavor fitting into a reductionist and a, a physicalist or materialist paradigm, are in the Trojan horse. That's my extreme position. If I moderate that, well, I would say there's a key distinction. And certainly, uh, I see a lot of good work being done by those who are bringing meditative practices, and of course, the name of mindfulness is very well known today, uh, bringing those practices in for benefit uh, in the areas of therapy and uh, uh, and, and health-related areas, even business, flourishing business today, mindfulness in business. Um, uh, and, and so I'm not, I'm not fully knocking that, not criticizing it fully, um, but I think there is a distinction. Um, the, the critical distinction, so in, in incorporating aspects of these ideas and practices drawn from especially mystical areas, uh, into health, etc., uh, that can be very positive as long as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, there is respect for the wider context from which these practices are drawn. And I would say also that there needs to be some recognition that engaging with the wider context, which usually is religious, although that's not a very popular word, um, engaging with that broader context can bring deeper and potentially more 
potent benefits, and importantly, not necessarily only to the individual. Not so narcissistic. Um, so I want to distinguish that, which I see as a constructive move, from those who would say, and I think there is an increasing number who would say, that the only feature of these religious and mystical traditions that may be of value um, is that which can be made to fit into the dominant scientific and physicalist paradigm. All else is either delusion or baggage and so on. So with that introduction, let me quickly sketch what I want to do today. Firstly, to, to acknowledge choice between the glass or the microphone. <laughs> In respecting Vladimir, the glass is on the floor. <laughs> uh, so I want to say, I, I talk fairly briefly about this explosion of research and interest in the um, areas of meditation, etc. Um, and then the second, uh, my point as I've already sketched, that there's a misrepresentation of the sources from which we're drawing these kinds of practices. And finally, the, the implications, and, the, and in a way the, the thrust of my presentation will be more on the implications of transpersonal psychology. How, do we, how is transpersonal psychology positioned? Um, I, I think that this understanding of the uh, compromise too far, as I put it, reinforces the need for a discipline that can study psychological aspects of mysticism and mindfulness, etc., without compromising the ontologically challenging features of their context. And I'll continue to read, to read because I know it's difficult to see from the back. So the other point that I think is important is recognizing the needs of our time. And, and very briefly, just to say that I think the needs of our time are not the same as the needs when transpersonal psychology was, was born in the late 60s, early 70s. At that period, spirituality was a, was a taboo word. And encouraging dialogue between science and spirituality was an important goal. Today, that's no longer the goal. And so we need to look at that. Um, and the needs of our time, putting it that way, it's, it's not just to do with psychology, it's to do with culture and society. Uh, and then this, this final point, it mentions metaphysical assumptions, uh, that we need uh, pluralism, at both the methodological and explanatory levels of <coughs> transpersonal psychology. So, in, as I say, I'm, I'll be fairly brief in talking about uh, the, the recent interest in mindfulness and research. I think many people in the room will be familiar with a lot of the material. But, um, so, this is the first um, extract on this slide. <coughs> I'll read it again because I know it's difficult to see from the back. In a 2013 symposium at the New York Academy of Sciences, Two pioneers in the science of mindfulness were asked whether mindfulness should be regarded as a spiritual practice. John Kabat-Zinn replied, stating that he tends to stay away from the word spirituality, and Richard Davidson said, I don't talk about spiritual because I don't really know what spiritual means. Now, it's not my intention to set up straw men. Uh, I, I don't really want to criticize this too far, um, I, I, I have some sympathy with their statement because spirituality is such a poorly defined word and it may be wise, in fact, to steer clear of it to some extent. But I do want to point out the difference with what we might find in a conference such as this. I think most in the name of transpersonal psychology would have no problem in responding to such a question and, 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 it, and talking through what spirituality means. Um, and we need to think about the reasons why those kinds of responses might be made. Of course, there's already a, an assumption in the question, which is uh, um, when it talks about the science of mindfulness, of course, that, that's something to be noted. 
But in broad strokes, there are three issues, I think. One is this question of how we define spirituality. Um, and again, it's a long subject, and there's a big literature in that area. In very, very briefly, I just want to stress the importance of the word sacred. In my vocabulary, that is the word I would want to use. Again, you can challenge me about definitions, and I, I also acknowledge Rosemary in, 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 in that, and uh, what a wonderful presentation yesterday. Um, that's the first issue, because there's the context. The, 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 the second issue is about the simplification of practices. I usually refer to this under the term the Raisin Syndrome. I wonder if anyone makes the connection. This, uh, emphasizing the joys of tasting a raisin and how long you keep it in your mouth and find everything. I mean, of course, there's nothing wrong with that. I've, I've been involved in many practices, of course, doing with mindfulness, it's very important. But what I'm indicating and I'm concerned about is the way in which these rich ideas are packaged into fairly short, short systems. Um, that's the second area. The third, which I more want to focus on, is the area of research. Ah, somebody there. So the, the second extract is from some key researchers in this area. Uh, and again, I want to say how much I do respect their work, and I'm not wanting to be just a, a hatchet man, as we might say, in, in the UK. From the vantage point of the researcher who stands outside the tradition, it is crucial to separate the highly detailed and verifiable aspects of traditional knowledge about meditation from the transcendental claims that form the metaphysical or theological context of that knowledge. So the researcher stands outside the tradition. In actual fact, uh, none of these individuals who I've had the pleasure of meeting, I don't think any of them really stand outside the tradition in that they, they, they believe in the practice and they're involved with the practice. So maybe there's a question there to the extent to which people are outside that tradition as researchers. But I would take a different perspective, and again, I think this is very much in, in synchrony with what Rosemary said yesterday and, and, and the thrust of her work, that in the area of transpersonal psychology, we're not trying to stand outside. On the contrary, we're saying that the process of research is very much about the transformation of the researcher. Again, I think that's even in the subtitle of, of your book, Rosemary. Um, and I think that's what is, what is distinctive, is one of the features that is distinctive in transpersonal work. Um, but I think there's a deeper consideration here um, about the nature of science and the, 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 the false ideas around the paradigm of scientific naturalism. The notion that there is no metaphysical claim within scientific materialism, that's a false notion that we, we make choices about the metaphysical understanding which underpins um, our journey through life and the kind of research that we do. Um, and this idea that we can simply tease apart uh, thousand-year-old traditions into a chunk that we can put under the scientific microscope and leave the rest I don't think that's a correct view, and I want to say more about that. Um, so there's, there's really two things here. One is that last point I made. Um, if we try to divide the traditions in the ways that, that, that this research applies, are we in some way distorting the tradition? Uh, maybe throwing the baby out of the bathwater, or whatever it is. That's one point. The second point concerns the history of these traditions themselves. And a lot of the research that is done in the name of meditation and mindfulness is very much lacking a historical context. And I just want to quote here from a good friend of mine, uh, Jeffrey Samuel, who um, 
Well, I, I just read what, what he's, he's written. He, he, he's been, as a, as a scholar of Buddhism, the history of Buddhism, um, is trying to give that background in relation to what this research is trying to achieve. And uh, again, I'll read because I know it's hard to read from the back. Theravada Buddhist intellectuals, above all in Sri Lanka, came to see themselves as bearers of a supremely rational tradition, compatible with science in all significant respects. The more obviously theistic and religious aspects of Buddhism were dismissed as folk superstition, which were regarded as inauthentic. The Buddhism which resulted was, one could say, pre-adaptive for its incorporation in secularized form into the Western therapeutic context a century later in forms such as mindfulness-based stress reduction and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. In, in other words, the, the notion that we've got this rich tradition, in the case, case Buddhism, um, and we can look at it today uh, and, and see how it interrelates or fits within the scientific paradigm, uh, that's, that's not doing justice to the richness of the tradition because already, as Samuel points out here, um, the, the, there were changes within the tradition. He's talking about the 19th century, mainly. Um, so it's, it's, no, it's no surprise there is a relationship because it's been set up to have that relationship. And uh, Samuel's the, the implicit point here is that there's... Uh, there's the, 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 the way that the tradition was changed left out crucial aspects. Now, we could have another discussion about where these aspects, it's, uh, theistic for example, shade into superstition. And, and, and what is, you know, what's that blurred boundary? That's another subject. Um, but the point that Samuel is making, and that, that obviously that I would want to reinforce as well, is that certain key aspects are, are left behind because, in a sense, they're, they're, they cause some embarrassment in this dialogue. Most important within that aspect, as Samuel points out and I have pointed out, is the notion that um, consciousness may exist outside of any material base. That's a fundamental tenet in, in, in in most lines of what I call authentic Buddhism, um, and certainly in other traditions, obviously theistic traditions. Um, and I, you know, I, I would think from what I've heard in the conference generally uh, that uh, this notion that consciousness somehow goes beyond the brain in particular is, is part of what we, our worldview, uh, but the question is broader than that. The question is broader in the sense of um, are we struggling to incorporate consciousness within any form of physicalist approach. And again, I was very interested in uh, Harold's um, presentation yesterday and the distinction between quantum physics and quantum theory. I think that's very important. Uh, but again, I'll say no more about that right now. And uh, yes, the, 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 the second quote towards the, the, the bottom Again, from Samuel, the use, this use of Buddhist dry practice as therapy as a way of adjustment to life in the everyday world of samsara is in direct contradiction to the orientation of the Pali Canon of the Nikaya period of early Buddhism, from which these practices are often claimed to derive. The Buddhism of this period emphasized withdrawal from the everyday world of samsara, not adjustment to it. So, again, um, question is what, what are we trying to do? I, I, I just refer back to what I said at the beginning, uh, that I, I, I'm not trying to say that any use of mindfulness meditation in a way that can help people adjust to the world, it, it does not have benefit, I'm not saying that. But I think uh, we, we need to be aware of the, the, the mystical or spiritual needs of those who may be um, looking for nourishment and not sufficiently finding it through the way that mindfulness is packaged in the contemporary world. That's the point. Uh, 
Um, I'm not sure if it's quite right to quote oneself, so I'll sketch over this. But the, 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 uh, the, 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 the extract, I was writing an article a few years ago about neuroscience and, and spirituality, in which I reviewed uh, a, lot, a lot of this research at that time, and it's exploded since then, because there's a huge amount of research over the last four years, um, uh, in which I was looking at that, that review, and, and, and I mean, basically, it's it, what a, a great deal of the neuroscientific research is simply demonstrating what seems to me to be the obvious. Uh, if you spend a lot of try, time, in some sense, focusing attention, there are changes in the brain related to attention. Well, good, good. So, um, and as I said at the end there, the jury remains out. And, and the, the, the real point here, um, which again I think Jeffrey Samuel makes and, and I make in, the, in, the, in this, this particular chapter I was writing there, is that we may be missing an area of very interesting dialogue because of this overemphasis over on the, 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 the scientific paradigm. Um, and and in, in this particular chapter, Having said the jury remains out on that, that's what I go on to look at. Um, and anyone here who, who knows of my own work will know that I, it, it, it's a slightly different approach that I take. I'm interested in, um, as it were, modeling the process of mind in the broadest sense, not in a, not in a, uh, hopefully not in a reductive sense. Um, and uh, so I've looked at, uh, for example, the area of Abhidharma in the Buddhist tradition, which is particularly interested in the nature of perception. And we look at that to see how that particular perspective can be married together with uh, cognitive neuroscience research. The, uh, the other area that I've been very interested in, and those who came to my workshop will know, is the Kabbalah. And uh, in the Kabbalistic tradition, there is there are some very profound insights into the nature of mind. It may be couched, it's quite difficult to read sometimes because this material is quite codified, but um, ideas, for example, of, of the unconscious, ideas of expanded states of consciousness, um, and others too. And the, the role of language in particular, this is very strongly explored within the Kabbalistic tradition. And that is a, a very interesting area to explore in relation to transient psychology. And again, there's the potential of some integration there. So that's another uh, area for exploring the relationship between mystical, spiritual traditions, and, and, and psychology. Just, I, I didn't read the, the part at the bottom here, so let me do that. Um, a couple of quotes that I really like, finishing off on, the, on that subject of what's happening with uh, mindfulness and meditation research. Firstly, from Bodhi, uh, there is a real danger that the contemplative challenge might be reduced to a matter of gaining skill in certain techniques, dispensing with such qualities as faith, aspiration, devotion and self-surrender, all integral to the act of going for refuge, refuge, the Buddhist phrase. And Eleanor Roche, I really like this quote, pull on the tiger's tail of mindfulness and out leaps the tiger of wisdom, awareness, that may consume assumptions about our science and ourselves. Uh, and I think that, that epitomizes the point that uh, if we just think about these practices as skills for adjustment to life, to everyday life, we're missing something crucial. So it leads me, and again I have to stress that I'm kind of sketching ideas here, it leads me to uh, my fundamental thesis. And it, it is interesting that a transversal psychology doesn't have a very long history, but within that history there is such a, 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 there has been such a challenge to clarify its definition. 
uh, and I think the reason for that is because it shades into spiritual quest. In other words, it's not a detached discipline in the sense of we're outside looking in. We want to be inside with all that that implies for development, transcendence, etc. And we need to incorporate that in our decisions. So then the question is, well, what does it mean to be inside? With these traditions where, almost without exception, there are ontological assumptions which do not fit with a reductive materialist perspective. So here, this is what I have said. There is a need for a branch of psychology. And the word need, I alluded to this before, but I want to stress, I think it's important. I'm using the, need, the, the word not only within psychology, but I think in our society more generally. I might sound a bit grandiose, but that's the nature of the business, the game. There is a need for a branch of psychology which operates according to an approach that is not constrained by naturalistic materialism. Transversal psychology must be open to insights from mystical traditions about the nature of mind, which challenge metaphysical assumptions of science whilst at the same time building on scientific foundations. And that means that we need pluralism in transpersonal psychology. Pluralism in relation to methodology. Again, I think that was covered very well yesterday morning. And pluralism in relation to what are the appropriate metaphysical categories of explanation. To, to, to put it Another way, I already mentioned my interest in the Kabbalah, areas of Jewish mysticism. And I've studied, I've studied the Kabbalah for getting over 40 years. And I never cease to be amazed by the depths of insights that I find in that tradition. But they're not worn on the sleeve by any means. And the only way to, to, to get in touch with those insights is to engage in even a kind of playful way with the textual core itself. And if you do that with a purely um, physicalist paradigm, then it's as if you're trying to engage with that material with one hand tied behind your back. And you will miss those, I think, real insights, which are relevant to psychology. That, that, that's, that's putting it a strong, in a strong way. Um, again, this is, I think, an interesting point and, and, and one that could be discussed further. It's the, the extent to which transpersonal psychology shades into religion by another name. Now actually the word religion is quite unpopular, so we might want to say spirituality, but that's another discussion. But there is, um, I think, a lot of people are searching for a, a, a path, which in a, an older age would be called a, a religious path, and they are searching for that within transpersonal psychology. Now when I say that we need to be open to uh, ontological ideas, uh, maybe that spiritual presences have some kind of ontological reality. When I say that, there is the danger that we're talking religion by another name. And that's an issue we need to look at. My answer to that, uh, it, more than I can squeeze in here, but, but at essence, it's recognizing that our primary interest is psychology. In other words, we're looking at this spiritual and mystical traditions to the extent that they help us in our understanding and, they, and moving forward and formulating hypotheses in psychology. And that comes into the, 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 the thesis that I put there. So, now to move on, to explore that a little bit more. And I think most would agree that our business is largely around spiritual and mystical states of consciousness. 
There are, again, I know this will be difficult to read from the back, so I'm going to read it all through. I think that divides into two areas. Um, uh, firstly, on the left, is training the body-mind. And on the right, is connecting with some form of a larger present, larger reality. I think, I mentioned already difficulties in defining spirituality. In my definition, these two would be crucial. Of course, it begs the question, what do we mean by larger? So just to run through a, a few, in training the body-mind, it is about attention, it's about being able to de-automatize the ways we operate, um, developing levels of compassion, and so on. Um, and on the other side of the equation, I, I just, sorry, I missed out at that, that left-hand side. Uh, I think the area of psychology that is most equipped to deal with that, which is where my background in research lies, is cognitive neuroscience. It's a very powerful discipline. There's no question about that. Connecting with the larger, well, I would include um, a number of, of areas uh, in which uh, the, the, the individual is in touch with what they perceive as something larger. Again, that brings in the ontological question from the Kabbalah, and particularly uh, this idea of inspired exegesis, um, which is another whole subject in its own right. But, um, uh, what did it quote? Yeah, one of the great scholars, modern scholars of the Kabbalah, um, made this comment about the major work of the Kabbalah, which is the, the, the Zohar, dated from around the 13th century. And, and, and he put it like this. It's a really nice sentence, I think. From the point of view of the Zohar, visionary experience is a vehicle for hermeneutics, as hermeneutics is a vehicle for visionary experience. Uh, maybe you need to unpack that, but essentially, if you engage with these kinds of texts, which, for example, in the workshop we started to do a little bit about that, um, and of course it's not only in the, in the Jewish, the Kabbalistic tradition, most scriptural traditions, mo mo most uh, mystical spiritual traditions have a scriptural base, and the way in which you open up those sacred texts is at the heart of those traditions. So, but specifically, what is Wolfson talking about? He's talking about the fact that there is no distinction. We want to make a distinction between um, practice and experience on the one hand, and text and hermeneutics on the other. And when you really get into these traditions, and that's the point I was saying before about engaging without one hand tied behind the back, that distinction is not an accurate distinction. The mystic working with the text is bringing his experience, of course, but the text itself is, is engendering that experience. That's a very difficult idea to convey. I mean, I could go into half an hour bringing some text from the Kabbalah and making that point. It's very difficult to convey uh, because it doesn't quite fit into the way we see hermeneutics. But from my study of in particular the Kabbalah, it is a very accurate point. And again, I say it in the names of one of, one of the major scholars and other scholars of, of, of the Kabbalistic tradition in our day make this same point. Um, so I, that was an elaboration on this point about uh, inspired exegesis, anyway. Prophetic states. Um, the notion which uh, Harold referred to yesterday, the active intellect, this idea from Aristotle which was so important to the mystics um, of, the, of the 12th, 13th centuries, um, not, uh, in, in Sufism, Islamic mysticism, for example, as well as in the, in the Kabbalah, that there is a dimension of the mind of God, the active intellect, and this is where our intellect is, is making connection to that which is larger, because it's the mind of God. So that's the, the, the point there. And of course, the, the, the appropriate area of study is comparative religion, study, the scholarly study of mysticism. The point I'm making in this slide, oh, sorry, it's another little limo I want to bring in, which is what links these two areas. And I would say, and again, this is opening up another discourse, it is access to the unconscious. That's the key link between training the body-mind 
and open it to something larger. Um, and again, I think it wouldn't be lost on most in this room, but the unconscious is not simply a personal, individual uh, uh, depth of the mind. There's something larger. We're connecting. And again, that idea itself, that, that, that what we would call unconscious, is something that actually opens to the mind of God. That idea goes way back in Kabbalistic writings. So it's not only modern. Um, and I put down there imagination, because I think that's really important, that the, 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 the point of contact, I mean, think Jung's active imagination, for example, and the way in which this impinges, impinges on methodology. Um, uh, Andre... Drugin, I don't know, an anthropologist who emphasizes what he calls methodological ludens, drawing on the, the great work of Victor Turner in, in Ritual, that, that Homo sapiens is much Homo ludens as uh, sapiens, and, and, and that we use imagination and playfulness uh, to engage with the, the traditions, and that needs to come to an, in, into our methodology. Um, yeah, it's another subject. But the, the, the real point being that the, the discipline that is equipped to deal with that particular point is transpersonal psychology in my, in my canon. And moreover, if you can see the bottom of the slide, that you know, transpersonal psychology, in my view, is the discipline that does indeed bridge uh, comparative religions, scholarly study of mysticism, etc., and the, the different, the, 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 the traditional areas of psychology. And then we need, therefore, to explore what it is that makes of a subject a discipline in, in the academic sense. Again, more than I have time to go into, but, uh, you know, as, as speaking as someone who's sat in a major university as a professor of transpersonal psychology, there is no question that there are issues about how we fit into the academy. And, well, again, it's going to have to be brief, but uh, I think what makes a discipline in that sense is first, obviously, you have to have an agreed area that you're interested in. In our case, it's to do with the mind, consciousness, and so on. And then there are uh, three areas, really. One is to do with um, the uh, kinds of explanatory structures that we would uh, incorporate. So, uh, we'll build this up first and then you'll see. Uh, one is to do with the explanatory structures, another is to do with methodology, another, in our case, is to do with the value placed on the whole idea of transformation. And you will find, and again I'm going to rush in, I'm rushing over this a little bit, but you will find that each of these varies in relation to the, the level, as I would call it, of the approach. So for example, in my discussions with neuroscientific colleagues, it's not simply that they are not interested in, let's say, spiritual presences. That's fair enough, I wouldn't blame them for that. Um, and of course there is a issue of methodology, but also as far as um, transformation is concerned. Uh, the only point of any change will be to help people to be normal. And that, actually that point itself goes back to what we've been saying about mindfulness in the contemporary context. Uh, do we want to be normal? Hands up. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then the explanatory structures, well I'm not going to read everything in the, this point, but this, you know, every discipline has to have, or in order to be a discipline, there has to be a level of agreement as to what kind of explanatory structures we're going to debate together. And again, that's why when I'm talking in terms of the study of Kabbalah, there are places when I part company from your science. It has to be. And I've sketched out here some examples. Obviously, you know, the lowest level we're talking about, and, and lower and higher, I don't want to say it's, it, it's an implicit pejorative statement, but you have to have some uh, spatial representation. Uh, in any case, um, the, 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 the neuroscientific is to do with patterns of neural communication, etc. Um, and the point being that we can't, and I think everyone knows this, the point being that you can't simply reduce a higher to a lower. 
Um, so an interesting example is, let's say, what we mean by archetypes. Obviously drawing from Jung in particular. And Jung was severely criticised for his treatment of the notion of archetype. And Jung was struggling, I mean there's another, another hour's talk, Jung was struggling with how he could fit into the world of his day. And our world is not the world of Jung's day. This is why I'm saying that we can have a different, we can, maybe we can be a little more liberated than Jung was in, in trying to have his work accepted. And in many ways, it wasn't accepted by those that he was struggling to fit in with in any case. Um, well, that's another subject. And when it comes to methods... Um, so, yeah, I'm going to finish pretty soon, I know the time is running out. Um, I, I think this last column about methodology is really important as well, uh, and again this was covered many, uh, uh, largely yesterday, um, but it, I think it's important to recognize the centrality. Uh, <laughs> nothingness. <laughs> the centrality of nothingness. But if we haven't seen it, there was a little animation there which brings up hermeneutics and it makes the point that all those levels of methodology actually centre on hermeneutics. And again, I think I'm touching on some of the same area. I mean, you can be the hardest no scientist there is, you still have to interpret. And, uh, and of course, this is nothing new, uh, others have written about this, but it does, uh, I mean, recognizing the centrality of interpretive hermeneutics, I think it does relate well to what I've been saying about my particular interest in, in, in the Kabbalah, but there are other traditions also. Um, okay, so where's the man with the red? <coughs> the, the sign of death. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, I'll, I'll finish on that point, and uh, obviously any questions you can catch me individually. Um, let me just finally bring it together. Um, I, I think the point will have been made. Uh, the, uh, my position is that there are great insights into the nature of mind, and the process of transformation in mystical traditions especially, and the niche for transpersonal psychology is to bring out those kinds of insights, and I don't think you can do that fully, neither in the, in the explanatory domain, nor in the transformational domain. You can't do that fully without suspending disbelief, let me put it that way. And that's part, and again, just to tie it together with something I said before, about homo ludens. Yeah. Suspending disbelief is the way in which we engage with the, the, the depths of the traditions. Not, I think, through subjecting some poor Buddhist monk to an EEG. Thank you. <laughs>